In his letter to the Philippians, Paul wrote these words. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I want to live like that. Sometimes I think, what will people say of me when I'm only just a memory? When I'm home where my soul belongs? Was I loved when no one else would show up? Was I Jesus to the least of us? Was my worship more than just a song? I want to live like that and give it all I have so that everything I say and do points to you. If love is who I am, then this is where I'll stand. Recklessly abandoned, never holding back. I want to live like that. I want to live like that. Am I proof that you are who you say you are? That grace can really change our heart. Do I live like your love is true? People pass, and even if they don't know my name, is there evidence that I've been changed? When they see me, do they see you? I want to live like that and give it all I have so that everything I say and do points to you. If love is who I am, then this is where I'll stand. Recklessly abandoned, never holding back. I want to live like that. I want to show the world the love you gave for me. I'm longing for the world to know the glory of the King. I want to live like that and give it all I have so that everything I say and do points to you. If love is who I am, then this is where I'll stand. Recklessly abandoned, never holding back. I want to live like that. I want to live like that. I want to live like that. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pam. I want to live like that. Amen. As we... Uh, pray this morning, I want to share just a couple of uh, prayer thoughts uh, with you. One is a, um, a praise, I guess. Yesterday we had a work day here. We had several that uh, came out for that, and we were able to clean 
away a lot of brush along the lakeside. So that as you leave this morning, you look out there and you see all the brush piles. And uh, there was a lot of good work that was done. And so that, that's a good thing. Uh, I want to pray for, for Debbie Phillips this morning. Um, um, Deb, Debbie has a, a, a G tube, a feeding tube, and uh, the doctors are, are not sure about changing it out, and that's how she receives her, her nourishment. And um, so there are some decisions that the family has to make, and they'll be making those in the next few days. So kind of lift Debbie Phillips up in your prayers today and be with her and also with, uh, with Matt as we... Um, um, as, as you pray. Um, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunities that we have to be joyful. We thank you, Lord, for the things that we have to praise you over. And Father, we praise you mostly and most importantly for your son Jesus, for sending him to be our redemption, sending him, Lord, so that we can have eternal life, sending him, Lord, so that we could have an abundant life here and now. And Father, we pray that we might live in such a way as to reflect your love to those around us. And Father, that we may uh, be faithful to the calling that you have upon our life. Father, we're grateful for that. This morning, Lord, we lift up Debbie Phillips in our prayers. Pray, Lord, that you'd be close to her through your Holy Spirit, that you'd minister to her. Lord, as you do through the uh, caregivers and the nurses, Lord. Uh, be with Matthew, be with Peter. Uh, Encourage them as they make these important decisions uh, over the next several days. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your love. We thank you, Father, for your kindness. We thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have of eternal life. And to know, Lord, that this life is not all that there is, but the, what awaits us who belong to your son Jesus, uh, we, cannot even, we cannot even imagine. And so, Father, help us to fix our hope and our focus upon you and upon that. We pray, Lord, that you would, through our continued worship today, that you would be honored, that you would be lifted up, and Lord, that we might say that today it was good to be with your people in your house, offering up praise. Thank you, Lord, for redeeming us. Thank you, Lord, for not holding our past against us. Thank you, you th we thank you, Lord, that you're not surprised by it, you're not intimidated by it, you do not turn your back over our past, but Lord, you reach out and seek out to embrace us, to bring us into relationship with you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A 39-year-old mother of four suddenly had a splitting headache. When I say that, you might think, well, that's not so unusual for a mother with four children to have such a headache. But suddenly, she found herself at the hospital, and after surgery for a uh, brain aneurysm, uh, she was recovering well. The only side effect of the surgery was the fact that she had partial amnesia, and she uh, forgot, had no memory of, 16 years of her life. So as far as she was concerned, she was a 23-year-old mother of four, of four children, and she had forgotten many of the 16 years of happiness, 16 years of achievement, but also she had forgotten 16 years of pain and regret. So think about that for just a moment. Would it be a blessing for you? Would it be a blessing for any of us if we were able to erase our past? or at least parts of our past. Or we could pick and choose what part that we didn't want to remember at all. Are there those mistakes, those poor choices that we would simply like to forget? Are there some memories that we would rather not have remembered that we would kind of like to do 
when we hit when we're on the computer we just want to hit the delete button now if we live long enough all of us will have a past many of us would like to erase some of those past mishaps and those past errors there was a woman who lived in Sychar and Samaria during Jesus's ministry and when we look at her life I am sure that she surely had those those moments that she would have liked to have had forgotten she encounters Jesus at this well on a hot and dusty day the midday the hottest part of the day and this encounter that she has with Jesus shows how Jesus can redeem can can buy back an unbelieving past if you have your Bibles I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of John at John chapter 4 now if you have your Bibles if you have it on your phone you have it on your tablet I really encourage you to go and, and to find this this passage we'll have some of the passage up on the screen uh, but not the whole passage I'm going to read the whole passage but some of it will be up will be up there so if you have a Bible I encourage you to look at this passage for yourself um, up on the screen it's going to begin in verse 4 I'm going to begin reading from verse 1 of John chapter 4 so I invite you to 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 find that passage John chapter 4 verse 1 now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples and so he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee now he had to go through Samaria so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired as he was from the journey sat down by the well it was noon. when a Samaritan woman came to draw water Jesus said to her will you give me a drink and then John tells us gives us a little commentary here he tells us that his disciples had gone into the town to buy food the Samaritan woman said to him you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman how can you ask me for a drink and again John gives, fills us in a little bit he says that Jews do not associate with Samaritans but Jesus answered her if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water sir you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep where can you get this living water are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it itself as did also his sons and his livestock Jesus answered everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst indeed the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life verse 15 the woman said to him sir give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water and he told her go call your husband and come back I have no husband you are right when you say you have no hus husband the fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband what you have just said is quite true sir I can see that you are a prophet our ancestors worshiped on this mountain but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem woman believe me a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you Samaritans worship what you do not know we worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seek God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth 
The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you. I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Then in verse 39, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, Jesus, they urged him to stay with them and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. So this woman, we don't have her name. She's just referred to as a Samaritan woman. And as John tells us, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. The Samaritans had nothing to do with the Jews. And the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. And so, so Jesus confronts this, this woman at the well, at, at this well. And, and, and she carried with her an empty water pot. And this empty water pot kind of symbolized... her empty spirit and it also symbolized her empty soul her body her life was as dry and dusty as the ground was all around it and every day at noontime she would take that pot and she would go down to the well in the hottest part of the day to fill the water jug up to take home. Now most of the women would come early in the morning when it was cool. But she came at noon because she didn't want to hear all their chatter. She didn't want to hear all of their talk. She didn't want to hear all the things that they were saying about her behind her back because of all the choices that she had made in her past. And all the things that were done many, many years ago. And so she came by herself. She came, she came in the hottest part of the day. And as she came and as she went to the well to fill that water pot up, she, she was thinking about her past, her failed relationships, her empty promises that were, the empty promises that were made to her by others the wrong choices that she had made. And, and every day, her past haunted her. She could not get away from it. And folks, in a certain way, our jars are empty as well because oftentimes our past haunts us. We see the hurt and the pain of, of, of decisions that we have made that that really weren't very wise. We see those, those lost opportunities of choices that might have made us happier and, and, and we forfeited all of that. We would love to go back. We would love to go back and, and, and retrieve a word or two that we spoke in the heat of the moment in haste. We would love to go back into our past and correct a very despicable mistake. To go back and take another road. To go back and undo an event that has brought us down this road that we traveled this morning. But you see, we can't enter a time machine. We can't go back in time and redo what we have already done. And so what we need with that being the case, what we need is a new beginning. What we need is a fresh start. 
What we need is some kind of redemption from the past. We desperately need a cleansing. We need a cleaning. We need someone or we need something to take away the sting of our past. And that's what Jesus did for this Samaritan woman. And folks, that is what Jesus desires to do for us today, right now, at this moment. And, and he gives us some tools that we can use to redeem our past. And the first tool that we can use is that we need to face it. Face the past. Uh, there was a um, famous preacher a hundred years ago, a man by the name of Brownlow, Brownlow North, Brownlow North, famous preacher in his day and time. And uh, in his early life, he, he lived a rather wicked, a rather immoral life. And, and, and one day, just as he was getting up in the pulpit to, to, to preach, uh, someone handed him a letter. They handed him a note. And, and in, this, in this letter, uh, the writer claimed to have some kind of evidence about this preacher's life. And, and he said in this letter that if you get up and you start preaching today, I'm going to show, I'm going to tell everyone everything that I know. And so the man took the letter. The man took the letter. North took the letter with him. He got up to preach. And he opened the letter and he began to read it to the congregation and, and, and he told them about his sins about being a young man and he admitted that the charges in the letter were true but then he went on to describe how that the love of Jesus Christ had changed his life and how the love of Jesus Christ had cleansed him from all sin you see facing up to our past uh, facing up to who we are Facing up to what we have done is, is part of what we call repentance. It's part of what we call turning away. And, and repentance is essential if we are going to receive God's forgiveness and are going to be redeemed. Jesus knew the past of this Samaritan woman. And, and her past did not surprise him. Her past did not intimidate him. Her past did not cause Jesus to look the other way or to ignore her or to make believe like she wasn't there. Jesus knows our path. He knows yours. He knows mine. And, and confessing our sin uh, is, is not really such a frightening thing. It, it's kind of a comforting thing. It, it's kind of a freeing thing. You see, since Jesus already knows it, since Jesus already knows who we are, when we face up to it, then we can experience God's love and God's forgiveness. And so if, you, if you've never been saved, and I know we use that term, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but, it, but if we've never come to that point in our life when we have, have as the ABC salvation uh, verse goes, if, if we've never come to that point in our life where we have admitted that we are sinners or that, that we have fallen short of what God wants us to do and what God wants us to be, as hard as we've tried and as many times as we've rung the bell and doing the right thing, there are those times when we've missed it completely. If, we, if we've never been saved, we, we, we need to begin by repenting, by, by, by turning toward Jesus Christ, being honest with ourselves, and, and have faith in what Jesus has done for us. So we need to face the past. And then secondly, we see here we need to release the past. We need to let it go. Any change in our behavior requires a total release of our past. Like this Samaritan woman, we must discover the living water to fill the emptiness of our souls. You see, repentance is not just turning away. Re repentance, is, repentance is not just facing our past and being sorry for it and, and emptying ourselves 
we need to, we, we, we need to release it. We need to let it go. Once we know God's love, you know God's love? Once we know God's acceptance, you know that God accepts us just as we are? Do you know that we don't have to do anything to be accepted by God, but just allow him to accept us? When, when we know God's love, unfailing love, and we accept God's love, then we can let go of the past. We don't have to carry it with us. I want to give you a verse this morning. I'm going to give you a verse. I found this verse this week. It's in Isaiah chapter 43. Maybe you're familiar with it. I, I wasn't. Isaiah 43. And in Isaiah 43, God promises to redeem Israel from captivity. Now remember, Israel had been taken captive by the Babylonians because they had turned against God. Uh, they had been taken into captivity because they no longer followed God's way and God's rules and what God wanted them to do. In fact, they stuck their tongue out at God. And they said, we're going to do things our way. And sure enough, they did. And God said, if you do that, the consequences are you're going to be taken into captivity. And, and, and they just turned their back on the Lord. Now, in Isaiah 43, God is talking about bringing them back. God is talking about forgiving their sin. God is talking about taking them back from Babylon and bringing them back to Jerusalem. And then in, in chapter 43, in verse 16, it says, this is what the Lord says. Not what Isaiah says. It's not what I'm saying this morning. But in Isaiah 43, verse, verse 16, I believe it says, this is what the Lord says. Then you look at verse 18. This is the verse I want to give you today. Isaiah 43, verse 18. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Wow. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. So often, I don't know how it is for you, but I'll confess, so often the past explodes in front of my eyes. The Lord says, forget the past. Do not dwell on the past. By the way, where is our past? You know, do, is it in a briefcase that we carry around? Is it locked up in a safety deposit box? Is it, is it something, it, is, is, is our past something that we throw in the closet with all the other skeletons? You see, you see the past um, is not here anymore. The past is not here anymore. We can't show other people our past. It's not here. The past is only a memory. It's a memory of, of, of how we were. It's, it's a memory of how things were. It isn't a picture of how things are today. And so often our self-image, the way that we look at ourselves today, rests on this mental evaluation or this mental picture of our past behavior. Our self-image so often is tied to something that no longer exists, that's no longer there. And it's that mental picture that we need to let go of. Jesus renews and refreshes our mind so that we can walk in victory instead of defeat. And so we need to face our past and we need to release it. And then thirdly, we need to trust our future to God. Once we've released it and faced it and released it, then we're in a place where we can trust God with our future. God has some wonderful new beginnings, some exciting new uh, blessings that, that await us as we place our life in his hands. Now, I want to go back to Isaiah 43. After God tells Israel to forget the past, listen, after he tells them, don't dwell on the past, look at verse 19. See, I am doing a new thing. 
We talk about a new beginning. We talk about we need a, a we, 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 we need to be, we need to start something new. We need to be refreshed. We can't change the past, but we need a new beginning. We need a new starting point. And the Lord says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now, it's kind of scary. It's kind of scary to trust our future to the Lord because the past looms large in our mind. But the Samaritan woman... She trusted. She took that step into the darkness or into the unknown. And she based her future not on her past, but, but she based her future on Jesus. She came face to face with, with Jesus the Nazarene, with Jesus the Savior, and she placed her life, her past, her present, and future in his hands. She gave it all to him. And, 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 and notice that Jesus didn't ask for for a commitment card. Jesus didn't ask her to sign a contract. Jesus didn't ask her to, 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 to give some restitution because everything that needed to be done to, 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 for that woman to release her past, everything that needed to be done for her to trust Jesus, trust God for her future, Jesus took care of on the cross when he died. And when he died on that cross, he took her sins, her past, her present sins, her future sins. She, he took them all with him on that cross, and there they were put to death. And so he sent her on her way with a past behind her and a new future in front of her. Now, folks, that's the sermon. That's the message. That's the information. But now we have to come to the point of application. And we have to come to the point of, well, well, what do you mean? What do you want me to do with this? What do you want me to do with this? And, and, and so Jesus didn't just give her a new smile. He gave her a new purpose. And I want you to notice that, that, that she wasn't just merely a container, if you can see my container up front. She wasn't just merely a container of this living water, but she also, be, she also became a conduit through which that living water flowed to the people in her, in her village. She just couldn't stop talking about the Savior. She couldn't stop talking about what Jesus had done for her. She couldn't stop talking about the fact that he knew everything about her and he still loved her and he still accepted her and he, how he transformed her life. So this is the application this morning. Two challenges. Two challenges before you. The first challenge is that all of us stand empty before the Lord in need of being filled with that living water. All of us stand in need of the water that Jesus offers, of the eternal life that he offers to us. And so I challenge you this morning that if you've never been filled with the living water, if you've never received or accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that Jesus, that, that, that Jesus offers, I challenge you this morning to come and do it today, right now. Not another day, not another time. Don't think about it. Don't, allow the Lord to lead you through, his, through the Holy Spirit, and you come and you make, that, you make that decision today. That's the first challenge. That's what we see here. That's the application from the scripture. That's what this woman did. The second challenge this morning is once we have been filled with the living water, once we have, been, once we have received Jesus Christ as our Savior, I ch the challenge is to let it flow. To let it flow. Let it flow through us. Be a conduit, as this woman was, to our neighbors and our families and our friends. To share the good news. To let the living water flow through us. Just let it flow. You know how water runs? It runs downhill. Water runs the root of least resistance. And so when we share the love of Jesus and we share the living water, it's not, it's not hard work. 
We just let the love of Jesus flow. And Pam, thank you for singing that song this, this morning. We, we just let the love of Jesus flow through us so that people can see the Lord in our life. And they'll come to know Jesus as we came to know Jesus. Two challenges this morning. Number one, receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Be filled with the living water. And the second challenge is to let that love of God, that living water, flow through your life.